They tell me you're a man with true grit. What do you want, girl? Speak up at supper time. <laughs> Shane Davis and former IMCA Modified National Champion coming at you tonight, and we are out here at the Morris Race Shop, and I've got Jake Morris next to me. Jake, how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you doing? Oh, pretty good. How about uh, Mitchell? I'm Mitchell, doing... driver of the number 70. I'm doing great. All right. And Jeff, the Red Rocket. <laughs> How's things going down there? They're all good. All right, man. We want to remind you guys to make sure and uh, comment, like, and share this podcast. Yeah, and check out our website at www.dunright.tv for all of our racing coverage. Or you can go to dunrighttv.com for all of your TV, security, and solar needs. So, Jeff, we're coming up on the 2022 racing season, but what I want to talk to you about right now is uh, let's go back to the day when you and I were a lot younger <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, that 49 Chevrolet hauler that you had, ramp truck, that, yeah. uh, I mean, that was your way of getting around town. Yeah. And Ray Gus owned it, Gary Webb owned it, I owned it. That thing probably had 10 coats of paint on it, and then you <laughs> bought it. Oh yeah, I did, and I was pretty young, didn't have any money, and I uh, put a small block Chevy in it. It was, uh, it was, you know, a large truck. It had like 20 inch wheels on it, split rims, and I drove it to work every day because I had nothing else to drive. That's all you had. Hey, tell me about uh, sandblasting that thing before you repainted oh, it. Oh, geez. Uh, I grew up in the Long Grove area, and uh, um, the church there in Long Grove, they just put a new concrete parking lot in, and my friends lived right next door, and the uh, thing had about five coats of paint on it, so I took it up there and uh, I don't know, we put a truckload of sand through a sandblaster and sandblasted <laughs> that thing off. And then, you know, I'm like 20 years old and I just leave the mess, so that didn't, that didn't go over too well. <laughs> so bad. Hey man, with all the coats of paint that thing had on it, you probably had all different colors of uh, oh, sand down there. Oh, I said, I think there was five coats of paint on it. Yeah, it was crazy. It was fun, I wish I had it today. Yeah, that was a beautiful hauler. I love that thing, and a whole lot of race cars to the track. Now, you and I talked back in the day about how you know, you got the paving business, seal coating business. Uh, you've been very successful. You've got the storage units. Uh, but it wasn't always that way, Jeff. Uh, let's talk about the days when uh, you used to head down to E&J Metal and pop the seats out of cars, just grounds around for change so you could buy a hamburger. Yeah, you know, uh, there were days I'd rather forget. But, yeah, you know, when you're, when you're trying to get racing, and I can imagine doing that today, but even then, you know, I didn't come from a racing family, or not cars anyways, and uh, just you'd put every single penny you had in a race car, and there's nights, you know, <laughs> it's it's true, I didn't have enough to, money on me to uh, get anything to eat, so I'd go down to the junkyard, pop the rear seats off, because in them days, you know, <laughs> everybody in the back, their change would fall out of their pockets, and then they'd go behind the seat and go get, you know, I'd go get them out and do in a Reese's bar for dinner. But and the poor junkyard owner thought, man, that kid's out there a long time, and he never buys any parts. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> well, you know, that's, uh, th those are all great memories uh, back in the old days of racing. But let's uh, talk about another Quad City racing legend real quick. You had that Gremlin number 80. It was a white car, and, you know, it was your first race car. And you put that thing together in racing legend, Ronnie Whedon of Pleasant Valley, Iowa's front driveway in the dead of winter. Now you gotta wanna race. If you're, you know, it's probably snowing out there, Jeff. Yeah. A little cold. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I bought that car from Rob Connors and then I, I, you know, through Jerry and Rob, I, I met Ronnie and Ronnie was building these transmissions that I think maybe Gus was building them after him, but Gary Webb had a transmission when he drove for uh, uh, Bobby Tolan that was like what a Burton of Brin is today, but I believe it was in a, in a Muncie case, and and when they split up, somehow Ronnie got the transmission from from Bobby, and uh, and I worked in a machine shop, so I was making some parts for that. In return, he was helping me get a car together. But it was uh, you know it was in his driveway, and and it's in February, and you know <laughs> Ronnie <laughs> he could be pretty stern sometimes, and I, I'd come in to warm up, but he'd remind me that we only had a couple weeks to go till race time that I better get out there and get my butt to work. Get back out there and get that car built, man. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's funny. 
uh, what a, another great story. So let's uh, talk about, uh, you know, IMCA Modifieds. Here it is, the largest sanctioning body in the United States. You know, we've got uh, 7,000 members, 120 racetracks nationwide. Uh, what was your deciding factor to get into an IMCA Modified back in the day when you and I were racing? Well, when we started, you know, everything was pretty much IMCA. And, um, and it was cheap, you know, it was something you could go, go build, you know, relatively cheap. And, um, and that's what, what sold the class. That's why it took off the way it did. And Jeff, the posters, I remember uh, Keith Kanak hanging around town. They said, you can go racing for under a thousand dollars. Remember yeah. those? Oh, I, I remember them, you yeah. know, uh, you know, and so the racing, you know, really took off because the class was cheap. They had claim rules, which you of all people know what that's about. You lost probably as many motors as anybody. Yeah. And um, they kept it cheap for a good long time. But over the years, it's, uh, it, you know, you might as well be racing a late model, really. It's, I mean, it's, it's really evolved. Same cost. You know, I think one of the saving graces of the class is, though, I mean, there for a while, uh, you know, when we were running open motors, uh, the motor cost was getting out of hand. But I think that 604, 602 crate, has helped save the sport and economize it and give you an engine you can run for a long time and, and it's durable and doesn't take a lot of a Yeah, I think that was a really good on move it. on their part to go to the crate motor. Um, takes the night out of the shop so a guy can hang around with his family a little bit more. What? It, but it, it just seems like they need to do something again right now. Alcohol, $6 a gallon. Um, race gas, 110 is uh, $13 a gallon. The uh, um, the tires as of today or or this week are $150 a tire. Wow. The tires we have three four years ago it's the same brand, but they last three four nights. Now after after one night you're looking at the right rear and saying, man, should I really be running this another night? So they're not a very good tire for what we're paying for them. And, and there's other options out there, and I just wish IMC would get their head out of their ass and see what that option is. All right. Hey, so uh, they allowed you to groove tires, uh, you know, with COVID and production issues and all that stuff. Did that siphon the tires and grooving them? Did that help out making a tire go a little further? I mean, Mitch can probably tell you more about that. About he that, works Mitch. on the tires. Yeah, yeah. The you can get double the life out of a tire now. Be okay. Able to groove them. There's quite a bit to go. There, all right. So, Good. yep. Good. Hey, I'm looking behind me. I'm looking at these uh, sharp-looking modifieds back there. Mitchell, you uh, you know went through a period where you were dominant early on in your career, and then you know we uh, you went through a period where you struggled. But Wilk, let's look at uh, you know picture number thirteen up there. That'd be Mitchell's uh, first open wheel modified. It was that red and yellow car, number ninety eight, and just a beautiful uh, beautiful machine. And you won a lot of races in that car. You started out in what? what developed in a sport mod, but they call it the old B-Mod class back yep. then, I believe. And uh, you won a lot of races. Uh, tell me about, uh, you know, why you got into racing and what you liked about running that uh, limited modified class. Well, I just, uh, since I was just just a little kid, I always went to the races, you know. And uh, then when I got older, I got to, um, Helping, well, I was always helping in the garage and stuff, and and then when I got a little older, I, I actually probably started going in the pits and helping when I was probably when I was about 12. Yeah. And you're uh, supposed to be 16 then, but he's always a bit. Yeah, curious, he was so. 16. Well, I was actually yeah. 14 is when you get in, but yeah. I, you no, know, I just, um, um, no, I just didn't know any different. Um, we always uh, rode four-wheelers and three-wheelers and stuff and um, did that kind of thing and then um, I just decided I wanted to get into into racing and uh, it would have been uh, well that car um, okay the, yeah um, All right. had ended up racing that in uh, 2006 and 7 that same car okay and uh, yeah, won, won a lot of races with it. Had a yeah. lot of fun with it. Had a lot of fun. In, in, I didn't mean to put in 2006 when he had that car, it was a B mod. And then, then I was running A mod, and Jake Waterman worked for us. And, and Mitch and him were 
pretty much dominant in DMOD, and they were going back they and were. forth on wins. I think maybe you won points at East Moline and Tipton, Tipton, and he won at Alito. Wow. And um, so, you know, in the beginning there, it all, well, you know, how many, how they're going to whip on me on the win deal, mm -hmm. and I was running a mod. But, anyways, at the end of the year, I think that you won 13 or won four, yeah, 14 and, races. And Jake and won 15 or something, and it, but I had won uh, 21 20, or 22. 21, 22 features. So they that did. Year. I told them I was going to beat them together, yeah. and it didn't happen. But. Yeah, and back then I was uh, doing your website for you, and I yeah. and Jeff, you know, for several years, you were clicking off 21, 24, 26 yeah. feature wins a year. Uh, the Red Rocket was a dominant force in open wheel modifieds back then. I think yeah. that it's pretty hard. It, I say that it's be awful hard to do today, unless you look at Jeff Bone Larson, what he's done the last couple of years. You know, he's pretty much dominated, and everybody needs to work on their stuff a little harder to get where he's at. You know, he's he's the mark to beat. But I don't think that you can carry these cars today the way you could carry them before. They're just too much technology out there that, that you can buy. So everybody kind of has the same same thing, you know. Um, it isn't like you, I don't think you can take a 10th place car and win very easy anymore. Okay. And when me and you race, you could do that. You could do it, you yeah. Know, yeah, these things are hooked up so tight now. I think what we're gonna do, we're gonna put a big seat in that number 70 and I'm gonna go out and show you how it's done. <laughs> what you better go that? see if Jake Willer still has a driving seat before we stop <laughs> <to> that. <laughs> Okay, so Jake, uh, tell me about uh, you. Hey, you started out uh, racing. Now, you started out in a four-cylinder, or was that Matt? Yeah, no, I started out in a four-cylinder okay. in, I think, 2013. But all right. unlike Mitch, it was a little different for me. I played baseball, basketball, everything, all the way up till you know, I was a freshman. Unlike most dads, he never pressured us to race. I think he kind of wanted us to stay away from it because it was so, <laughs> so expensive. Yeah. But then after my freshman year of baseball, I was like, man, this team sport stuff, I'm, I think I'd be better off if I lose, I lose by myself, you know? And uh, I remember the night before my first uh, race, you know, at Davenport, my four cylinder, I think I was 15. I don't think I quite got my driver's license yet, okay. maybe 16, but he was begging me. He's like, listen, tomorrow you're gonna go race. And if you race, you're gonna be broke the rest of your life. You have to understand that. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no. And I remember after hot laps going out there and. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is, I understand why people are willing to give everything to do it, you know, and then wow. uh, the next year I built a Leaf Spring Sport mod, and um, unlike Mitch, I I sucked my first few years, to be honest, you yeah. know, but the, the class was developing so fast, and, uh, you know, I was on a high school budget, and yep. it just was so expensive, so. Man, yeah. so you went through a period of time where, uh, you know, you stopped racing altogether, and you're trying to get your, uh, you know, your uh, final graphics business up off the ground. And then last year, you end up lining the ride, lining the ride with uh, the flying hillbilly, Keith Hazlip. Yeah. Tell me about uh, that car. Now, I got to ask you, Jake, I'm talking to him down the pits one night, and he tells me what you have in that car for a motor. And I didn't believe him. He told me he had a 327 in that car. Yeah, it was a. It was was a little, it a little motor? Yeah, it was. He, was. he thought he had, you know, the crate killer or whatever. And... And I got it, and I'm like, man, this thing has no power. We need to get some gear in it. And once we did that, you know, I was able to be, you know, a little more competitive. But, yeah. You in know. fact, there was nights up there you were running with Mitchell. Uh, no. You know, for, you know, a few laps before yeah, you Yeah, a few off laps, and then it was well, the come yeah. As soon as I'd see his, I'm like, I'm getting out of the way. I am not. I am not starting that <laughs> war already. I got to wait till I can be passing him before I try doing that. So. So Dad retires last year, and then you come out. You've taken over... Uh, you know, the affordable business uh, for dad. And now you decide you're going to get back behind the wheel. Now your Mitchell, you know, has a, you know, Harris car. And boy, that thing, you know, you were, you were in the fight every night with that car. What is the car that you've got back there that's a sport mod that's right behind us? So I have a 21 Bills built. They're built uh, in like Park City, Kansas. Okay. Um, I had one, like that one pink car I had was one and... Um, we liked the people, the fabrication was really nice and it seemed like a pretty good buy and you know, we always like to be a little different. So uh, yeah, it took a few years off and then decided that if I was gonna get back into it, I wanted to do it right. So usually we would take an old A mod, cut it apart and make it into a sport mod where this one was actually built on the jig to be a sport mod. So good. yeah. 
Well, I want to talk about that. Now, Jeff, uh, we don't have it out here on display, but you've actually got Jeff Ike's old modified. Uh, what year is that car that's in back that's got new sheet metal um, on it? In fact, it's Jake bought it because he was going to race it, but then we decided let's do a sport mod thing again. Okay. It's, uh, is it 2019? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a 2019 car that Jeff Ike raced. It's a SMJ car, um, or JMR, JMR SMJ. But so tell us, JMR, uh, you know, so you've got Kai's work their magic on it. Yeah. But who actually builds the car before the Kai's His name's Jay McDonald. Which was the old J car. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then Kai's get them, and I think they change the tail on them a little bit. Yeah. I don't know, honestly, what all they do to them. But. And, man, uh, that car won a lot of races when Ike was in it. Yeah, it, it's sitting back there. If uh, It needs a drivetrain. Yeah, it, it needs so more Jeff, training, and Jake's ready to deal on it. So give him yeah, a Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I think I'm going to come out of retirement, and I'm going to buy that thing uh, for I'm going to race I'll give it to you if you do it. Yeah, you'd do that, wouldn't you, Jeff? I'll give it to you <laughs> because it's Jake's got the money in it, yeah, so I'll give yeah, it to okay, you. Yeah, okay, I'll go ahead, Shane. <laughs> Hey, it's a family affair. Yeah, why not? <laughs> so, honestly, uh, you know, if somebody wanted to get into racing, you're buying that car, uh, you're getting it without a drivetrain in it, but what would it cost somebody to buy that modified that you've got out here if somebody would be interested tonight? It, you know, it, it's got a good quick change in it. You just got to drop a motor in it, a couple little other things. It's like, a, you know, like an $8,000 car. Or oh, whatever. man. So $8,000 yeah. car, get a Nike's whole car, all you got to do is put a drivetrain in it. Not yep. bad at all. I won't sell for that. But. Yeah. But, you know, your dad would want 9000 out of it. But you'll learn. You know how your dad is. I'm not quite the salesman he is. Uh, or you know. are, I should That's say. That's right. Yeah. Hey, uh, let's look at the number two pick, uh, Wilk. That's that blue number 86 car. And back in the day, Jeff, what year were you running the blue car that you and John Nielsen had? Um, in 1990, John Nielsen and myself... Uh, became partners so we were 50 50 so all the blue cars we we're blue cars from 90 to 95 then in 96 and 97 we had yellow cars all right um we tell me about some of the shows you won in that car i mean you uh, you won some pretty big uh, yeah, shows in that we, we, I don't, you know i never was much to travel a lot i i raced on my budget you know if we uh if we made some money or, or won a couple races in a row then maybe we'd go somewhere else um, but I, I think, I think with them cars at John's and I, I think we won probably at least nine or 10 point titles. And then, uh, with Jameson's, I won quite a few too, 15 altogether, I guess. But the, the blue cars were all homemade that we made in my garage here in McCausland. And, uh, then he built his motors in Eldridge and they were, they were pretty low dollar. There wasn't hardly any leaf cars then. Um, but we were able to, you know, to win some of them $2,000 win races. I think the first time they had 10000 to win in uh, Burlington, Iowa, they had like 118 cars there, and we won everything the first night and ended up fifth in the big race. Wow. So, so Mitchell, uh, tell me about that Harris car you got. You know, I liked Harris cars when I used to go to the Super Nationals every year. Uh, you know, they were typically the dominant car up there for a lot of years. Harris kind of went through a period where – you know, they were struggling a little bit, but man, whatever you guys and, uh, you know, Harris did to tune them things up, all of a sudden last year, you're right in the hunt every night. What, what's different about, that's a 2021 Harris car? What's different about those, Mitchell? Uh, I, I think they, um, they just figured, made the front ends maybe better than they were. Okay. Um, but... No, they have good good tech support, and uh, they're just Kyle and and uh, Mark Elliott and all them guys are just um, good to they're good to get along with, and like I said, good tech support. You now, can, going from an open motor to a crate motor, you know, tell the people out there that don't uh, know what's the difference in those. I mean, you know, if somebody said to me today, uh, you know, hey. We, we're going to give you a new oatmeal modified. Do you want a 421 in it or do you want a 604 crate? You know, uh, me being old school, I'd say give me the 421, but you're, you'd actually be better with a 604 crate. Why is that? Oh, they, you know, they're obviously less power, easier to uh, hook up. Um, I mean, they got a lot of torque, but you're churning less RPM um, than. Uh, <clears throat> And their aluminum headed motor to where like the 
the claim motors there um, there's steel head motor flat tappet cam um, there is you definitely got a really feather the throttle with more horsepower than that oh there's, yeah and so it's just the dependent the, yeah you. the spoiler the spoiler helps and then it's just the dependability of the crate you know, in the back back in the day, you know, you and your dad and I, we'd always talk about how we typically had smaller motors. So, uh, you know, you might struggle in April when there was a lot of rain, uh, maybe the first of May. But as you got into the thicker racing season and the track slicked off, boy, those uh, little motors had really come to life. So, uh, the durability of this uh, crate motor. What do you have to do to these things? Uh, you know, I've heard people talk about changing valve springs. How often do you have to change the valve springs on those you know, things? Some do it every 10 or 12 nights. Um, we've we've run them a whole season before we change them. No kidding. Yeah. You know, wow. You know, but you can check the you can check the valve springs every every few weeks just to make sure that they're that they're not losing any. Okay. Yeah. Hon honestly, you know, it seems like uh, we've checked them at 15, 20, 25 nights. When he was racing all the time a few years ago. We, he, he was running those motors 40 nights, selling them, and what were you losing, $700, mm -hmm. $700 is all it cost him to run the motor 40 wow. nights. And so we never had the valve covers off several motors. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. he just put valve, valve springs in this, you and John, yep. uh, couple, had, you know, two weeks ago. Had a whole season on but, and, and this motor wasn't ours to begin with, so I don't know how many nights were on it for sure. But we took the valve springs out of it and checked them all, and they're spot on. We could, should have just put them back in there. They're, they're as good as the ones we put in it. Now, Jeff, you guys ran the number 86 for a lot of years, and then all of a sudden uh, you show up with a 70 on the car. Tell us a little bit about uh, Big John Brockman. He used to run in the old sportsman class over there at Davenport Speedway, and I remember the guy had like a 66 Chevelle, and uh, he was a number 70. Yeah. No, I don't know. It must have been like in, uh, well, it was in 07. John Brockman called and asked if I wanted to race his car the next year or whatever. And, and I had already decided way at the beginning of 07 that was going to be my last year. Mitch was, you know, in A mod and in high school and trying to race. And, uh, and it, it's tough to have a couple cars, and now we got three. But, anyways, uh, so. Um, I told him, I said, I don't plan on racing, um, but you can put motors in Mitchell's car. And, yeah. you know, Mitch was just kind of getting going then. But John took a gamble on it, and gosh, I'll tell you, that was in 2007. And you can see his name all over both them cars. The guy's uh, really been good to us. You know, he, he, he's a dear friend, and he, uh, he just likes the racing, you know. He, He's in it, you know. He's in his mid 80s now. It isn't like he can go down in the pits anymore. Right. But he's always at least at Downport to watch, and uh, just a good person, and, and we have a lot of fun with him. All right. So, uh, Jake, what was it like growing up in a family that was just dedicated to racing, diehard racing, and you know, it's a different life than a lot of the kids growing up today. I mean, man, your family every weekend, you're at the racetrack, and uh, were you cool with that, or uh, did you think maybe Dad should have spent more time at the ballpark with you? No, I mean, my mom always went with me to the baseball games, and to be honest, you know... I uh, love you, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, yeah, there's, like, all the dads were there, and he, you know, was he would go, but obviously I was always nervous when he'd go, but I wanted I wanted him to race because, you know, come Friday at, at Tipton, you know, we would go up there as a family and watch him race, and win and you know he'd say i'd cry if he didn't win but you know <laughs> i grew up right, did, i grew up right he? in his prime so like hey second second we don't take second Wasn't you know what i mean it's not yeah. acceptable so yeah no i mean i i loved the race and you know even though i wasn't in it at the time like mitch was but going you know uh to tipton and then east moline yeah i i wouldn't trade it for sure we've met a lot of good families over the years you did. Racing really is a family affair. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk about all the families that are at the racetrack, uh, uh, you know, it's just, there's just no better way to grow up. Now, hey, Wilk, uh, how about picture number six, that yellow number seven? Th this is uh, Terry and Ben Jamison's uh, car. Yeah. Uh, there's so many stories we could talk about about that car, but you won a lot of races in that thing. Uh, you know, I remember it being a Cobra car, 
but the seven had a unique design to it. Tell us about how that came about back yeah. in the day for the Jameson race well, team. Well, you know, his, his dad owned race cars for Bill Beckman for a lot of years. He had, he had I think, Arlo Becker race for him. A lot of different people did, and they had some always nice race cars. Uh, ben Jameson was a heck of a fabricator, and uh, he, uh, when his stuff went to the track, it, it, you're going to finish. I mean, it was good, unless you wrecked it. But then, you know, I think uh, 81 might have been their last year racing, and then Terry, his son, bought a modified, and, and I might be wrong about these years, but I think uh, um, in the late 80s, 89, I think, and then Bill Beckman drove it a few times in, in, on the asphalt at Cedar Rapids, and he crashed and broke his back there in it, and then, then Ryan Dolan was driving it on and off, and then in 1997, they built a brand new race car, and I, I was driving a late model for a guy at the time, and we weren't getting along real good. And uh, um, Dolan was driving it on and off, and he asked me if I'd be interested in driving it. So then he talked to Terry about it a little bit. And then I was just supposed to drive a special in it at the end of the year, 97. And I think I drove it, well, I, I drove it until the end of 2006. And then I knew I, my racing was slowing down, and, and then uh, Ryan actually got back in it. So we won a lot of races with it. Ryan won a lot of races after me. And then um, Ben, actually, he, he retired like, I want to say 2002 or 2003 from his day job. And when he did that and, and he could spend the time on the race car, things really turned around. And, and just about anywhere we went, we, we were good in it, you know. Now, Jeff, you were running a Cobra car. But I remember, uh, you know, in your prime, you won in any brand chassis that you drove and you had said to me one time that uh, chassis are just something you bolt parts to. Now as racing has evolved, do you still feel that way? No, I don't. I mean, uh, the technology, you know, it, it took off and now, you know, the way they're turning the stubs on these cars and then just some of the, the and I hate to say it, but some of the, the bigger manufacturers like Harris or, or Rage or whatever, they have so much input from so many drivers. It's it's hard for a, a smaller company that, you know, to to survive in this world right now. It's you know, love racing, world of racing. But because of course you ran stealth cars for a couple of years. Yeah, for you Mike know, Whiteman out of Centralia. Yeah, they were just out of. By you had a lot there. of success in that car, Jeff. Yeah, for sure. And uh, you know, he built a nice race car, but I, you know, it's just hard for a guy in his garage or even a shop this size that's only building ten cars a year. Yeah. To be competitive. I mean, there's guys out there that are doing it, but not like there, there was before. No, one thing I like about those stealth cars, man, they look safe. They just looked real safe. And I remember you shared with me one time, you guys were out of town racing, and Jake Waterman uh, turned his car sideways in front of the whole field. Uh, yeah, but he was actually in a J car that time. He was in a J car, <laughs> and that thing held up good. Yeah, it did. Yeah, <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you what. We, you know, we were, that would we all me. thought we lost them there for sure. Sure. It's a pretty good wreck. So, man, that would, uh, you know, I, I always wanted to be in a safe race car. And, you know, you had guys out there that were willing to, uh, you know, use thin wall tubing and yeah. uh, really, you know, take some chances. But, man, I thought, hey, I got to go to work on Monday. I don't think there's a lot of that anymore. I think that uh, they found that, you know, what they want in flex, you know, the, they didn't want all that thin wall tubing so much anymore. And those cars, they'd be really fast. You know, a thin wall car like that'd be really fast for 10 or 11 races and then they'd fall off. Okay. To where, you know, like a DOM car or a Mali car might take a little while to come in, but then you can use them for a good long time. And that's the thing with these cars is, uh, you know, back when you and I raced, they were kind of throwaway cars all they over. Were. Yeah. And uh, now they're, they're building them, you know, these bigger companies are building them and you can update the cars pretty easy. So if they have a different front end that works a little bit better, you know, they or they can uh, change the tail on them. They're not redesigning the whole car every year like they used to, like, you know, they used to. Mitchell, uh, the cost of shocks today has kind of went through the roof. And when I hear teams talking about uh, $5,000, $7,000 shock package on their cars, you know, back in the day, we used to, you know, we'd run a $100 Pro shock or, you know, pick your brand name. They were all economy shocks, and they were single valve shocks. Uh, what? Why are the shocks so expensive today? 
and why is it so important to have the more exotic shock packages than what your dad and I ran as an economy shop back in the day? Well, it's just these shocks now. Just keep the attitude in the car, and um, you just want to Explain to the people out there, when you say they keep attitude in the car, you're talking about keeping it up on the bar or yeah, what? Mainly, right mainly keeping keeping it on the right front consistently. Okay. I mean, you're pretty much buried on it. It's, then you're, the left rear shocks uh, has so much compression, it's holding it up. And then, um, but yeah, it's just, it's definitely gotten out of control. Um, I. We, we have decent shocks, but we, we don't spend what some of these other guys are spending. And um, I wish they would, um, I wish they had a different shock rule where we, we'd be more in the uh, under $100 a shock. Spec type shock. Deal, spec deal. shock or something. Yeah. But, yeah. Now, and, he, and he says that with the BSB. Yeah. <laughs> shock. Right. There you, you know, go. But, yeah. <laughs> Doing a little advertising for yeah. BSB. And, you know, as far as UMP cars go, you know, with IMCA, you know, I wish they had more options for the bodies because back in the day when Jeff and I were running, you know, there were so many different body styles you'd see out there, and I think the fans, you know, enjoyed that more. But, you know, that set aside, boy, I started looking at some of those uh, UMP cars that are out there, and I'm not going to, you know, pick on Nick Hoffman or anybody, but why are they putting those bodies on the cars sideways? It's all about aero, but, man, are they ugly. They are ugly. They actually changed rules this year. Yeah. In UMP. Yeah. Yep. UMP. Okay. And the and the new rules are. Yeah. The no curve in the sail panels or a pillars or anything. They had to be perfectly flat. Okay. The bot, they have uh, the whole base of the deck. The everything's got to be square now. Basically yeah. square and flat. I mean, it's nice that they they uh, changed the rules for sure. They're, it was getting out of hand. I, okay. I don't really know their rules really well, but. Um, the last couple of years, or at least the last year, they couldn't run a spoiler, so they gave them a spoiler back, but they made them make the bodies look halfway normal again. Yeah. But let's face it, none of this stuff looks like anything. You know, the, there's no creativity in these bodies at all. You know, they, you know that car there is from six years ago, and it doesn't look any different than that. Right. And that's a different brand than that, and they all look the same. You know, and that's in racing in general. I mean, when you look at the cup cars... And they've all got, you know, the same bodies on. They just got a different sticker package yeah. for the Chevys, Fords, and uh, Toyotas. Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, kind of sad that we've come to that point. Now, how important is it to keep air on that uh, wing on the back of the car in your sport mod, Jake? Because you're able to run a wing, and is that like an 8-inch wing, or how tall it's, is it's that It's 5 one? inches. 5 inches, okay. Yeah. Yep. No, I mean, they, you know, the spoiler thing is definitely a huge thing. And I think, you know, in the A mod class, that's a, you know, probably a really big difference between the crates versus the open because the opens aren't allowed. Where with the sport mod, uh, you know, the clay motors and the crate are allowed the five inches. But, you know, I think the spoiler thing's a, a huge thing, getting it just right, angled right. Because as he always used to tell us, you know, what people think that, those little spoilers and stuff don't make a difference, but if you go stick your hand out the window going down the road, you're gonna feel it versus if you just hold it straight, you know, out the window. So yeah, I think the spoiler thing's a huge difference and it helps, especially like sport mods are supposed to be beginner. I think that's why they got the five inch spoilers and helps people from maybe uh, not busting the tires loose or spinning out going in the corner. So, okay. yeah. Jeff, when you and I ran back in the day when we were running Leaf Springs, uh, you know, people laugh about that old technology, but one of the things I always liked about non-wing sprint cars was them guys were sideways in the turns. Yeah. You really had to drive the car, and we really had to drive the car back then. You know, what could they change today in racing that would make those cars sideways again instead of being hooked up so tight? You, you know, know uh, this is just my opinion, but I would like to see them only give us a couple inches of droop on the left rear and maybe after the race, say if they jack up the back, the, the four length bars can only have so much angle. Okay. And then, because that would make the car so they don't hop up on the left rear so much and, and suck the right front down like he's saying. So they would look like a normal car on the track. Okay. And then the driver would actually be driving it sideways, All right. not steering it sideways. And I think it would it'd make the, it'd make the track, I mean, it would make the racing better because the cars would be over the track. 
Now, I know that's going back a lot of years, and everybody that's fast right now, like, oh, my gosh, why would oh, we ever do that? Next time I see Jeff, I'm going to give yeah, him a piece of my yeah, mind. for sure. But I, I, I honestly think from a spectator's viewpoint, it would make the racing a lot more interesting because there, there's a lot of good racing, but there's nights where everybody's just kind of in a line, or there might be two grooves. But years ago, you know, there was, there was always two, three grooves, you know, how sure. that went. And, yeah. Top, middle, bottom, and I mean, yeah. man, pick one and go. So, Jake, uh, you're running a sport mod, so that's got a 602 crate in it instead of a 604. They're both GM motors. you got to buy them from a GM high-performance dealer. But what makes your motor different from your brother's motor? Well, I think the main thing is it has steel heads on it. You okay. know, the cam's a little different. Um, is there anything else, really? We have to run, well, I don't know if you have to, but I run pump gas on mine. So that's a huge thing right there alone because, you know, the cost of fuel, the cost of fuel. I go to, uh, you know, the local gas station, get 93 octane and I'm good for the weekend, you know, where the open motors have to do the racing fuel. And, and you know, my buddy that? over here pays twelve, thirteen dollars oh, a gallon for fuel. And I actually had an open motor at one point. It was given to me when I was like eight, 17, 18. And I was didn't have enough money to hardly get into the races because I was paying over a hundred dollars in fuel just to race that night where with the pump <laughs> gas, yeah. you know, fill up my truck, fill up the gas cans and, you know, go, to the get, go race. Yeah. So help me out a little bit, Jeff. Now the A mods today, they can run methanol or racing fuel. Correct. Do you run methanol in your car? We run, we run methanol. Like I said earlier, you know, the methanol is $6 a gallon. The, the racing gas, the 110 is thirteen dollars a gallon. That's not that's not why we do. We do with these crate motors because they're only 400 horse to, for the horsepower part of it. Okay. There are guys that are fast that, that run uh, race fuel yet um, because of the burnoff. They don't you know they don't want so much burnoff. But sure. you know we're not really concerned with that anymore with with the plan that we're on. You know. So back in the day when I was racing, uh, you know, when we were running on gas, we would uh, go through about seven gallons a night. And, you know, if we were running methanol, we would go through about double of that. Yeah. Is that kind of still the way it works? or You know, it really doesn't seem like them. Well, I shouldn't say this because he was leading a race this past summer at Damport and ran out of fuel on the last Yeah, I remember night. that night. But I think that we... Remember the car used... settling down? and <laughs> I think that uh, we usually go only between seven and eight gallons of alcohol a night. Oh, okay. Or in the feature. All right. But sometimes in the heat race, you know, if the, if the heat race is hammered down um, and the track is really slick in the feature, yeah. you know, sometimes that evens up to where, you know, we might go through six gallons in the heat race sometimes, you know, if you're on the throttle a lot more. Yeah. Wow. And Mitchell, you know, I see you driving around there. You, you get the car up on the bar. You know, how important is it to keep that car up on the bar and keep that left rear pin down and the right front pin down? No, oh, it's, it's big. Just uh, keep your momentum through the corner. Yeah. Um, you just uh, basically you want to be able to stay on the gas as much as you can. Yeah. Not have to use the brake much. And then uh, they got to be a lot harder to steer, are they, Jeff? You know, I did don't you ever know. hot lap Mitchell's car? You know, I. I I have. I, I mean, I raced a, I raced it down port at a special. In fact, is in that old car there? I think it, no, it wasn't. It no, was it was Todd. In Todd yeah. Reed's car, I got um, third. This was probably in 2015 or 16, and and you know I always had them stealth cars hopped up and wheeling pretty bad for that error, and um, so I I felt like boy this is pretty easy. But then I tried to race it another time and I wasn't so good. Um, but I feel like they steer a lot better. They're running six to one steering boxes now, so you're not hardly even moving your hands. Really? Just first then, time in a crate too. You yeah. Never raced a crate. Yeah, yeah. and it, it run good, but and I was surprised the motor the crate had because you know the last years I was racing, it wasn't IMCA, it was open motor stuff, and I couldn't believe how well that crate run compared to some of that stuff. So your cost of your engine uh, per season. Did your motor bill go from 30000 a year to 8000 or, uh, you know, obviously you had to save money by running the crate. I, you know, the crate motor in that car right there, and this car has been sitting a couple years, he bought it back, it's an old car of his, and he bought it back from Rich Smith a couple years ago. 
But that motor we bought in 2015, and it's had valve springs in it one time. And, and, and I know it's set for a little bit of that time, but it was raced a lot. Um, really, these crate motors, we're not doing anything to them. You know, when we were buying built motors, and, and I don't mean to be like towards the engine builders, but in uh, 2012, you know, we, we bought a motor from up north. I think it was $15,000 lasted 12 nights and hand grenade it, you know, and, and then we went through two or three motors that year and I'm like, man, we can't keep doing this. So then when IMCA came out with this crate motor for 2013, we thought there's no way that motor's gonna run with it. So we had, we had an arsenal of motors. We still got one here, but we had three of them up here just a month ago and I just sold two of them, but, because we went to, he, he won at Burlington with a built motor and then we went back the next week with a crate motor. And uh, and Billy Roberts, I'll pick on him a little bit. He came up to me and he says, <laughs> he goes, why would you bring a crate here? That's like taking a knife to a gunfight. Oh, and I'll tell you what, man. I think we probably won the next three or four races up there and, and a bunch at Downport during the same time because we were the first ones that got on the crate deal. Oh, and, man. And I'm telling you, they, uh, <clears throat> you know, everybody's on them now. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody can run very good with an open motor. And it's sad because I'd like to see the motor builders you know, get their part of, of the pie also, but it's uh, not happening. So what do you guys plan on running this year? I don't know. You have to ask uh, these guys about Dan, that. Danport every Dan Friday. Friday we'll nights. be there every Friday night. Okay. Then, um, we'll probably go to Makoka a few times. I plan on going to Moline a few times with the old yellow car. and. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm kind of excited about him going to Moline. I, you know, John Nielsen and I, we go up there every Sunday night and watch. Sure. And, uh, you know, that's where I started racing. Um, that's where I got ran over many times by Shane Davis. Hey, and, I was good at that. <laughs> and uh, that's where Mitch started racing. And uh, but it's been a long time since we've really raced there much. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And I don't know if we'll get Jake talked into that or not, but I'm I hope sure. so. I went once. That was hey, enough. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, one of the things I've liked about Davenport over the years, I mean, they, uh, they do a nice job of keeping the facility up to date and manicured. The bathrooms are like walking into a, you know, a five-star restaurant. They've yeah. they like ceramic tile in there. Uh, the whole facility's clean. And then, you know, Ricky Kai has really worked his magic, uh, you know, getting that track in great shape every night. And, you know, that was always one of the things when we were traveling is boy you'd pull into a track and think it'd be full of holes and yeah. and you know there was nights that you did damage to your race car and you never got in a wreck and you're like man this this is uh shouldn't be this way but now west liberty's going to have uh, probably about nine ten weekly shows this year would you ever consider going up the half mile that's up to these guys up to the boys. Yeah, yeah i'm considering it, yeah yeah well hey I've, man a racer just probably two times but I had good luck there and I really like the track yeah good it's awesome that uh you know Bud Guile and those guys are yeah you know anytime we can get another track open I mean it's you know we we're all in this together and we we just wish everybody good luck as far as uh getting these racetracks going and and keeping the drivers going you know this yeah. uh this year in fact is we both went back to open trailers and we're kind of it sounds silly that we'd even say that but we're kind of excited about having an open trailer just I it's, love it's easy, you know, and, and it's just for the for the kids running down. The, I know when I was a kid, if I seen a race car go by, I'd ride my bike down the block so I could see yeah. that car as long as I could see it, you know. Yeah. And you just don't you don't have that much anymore. And you had a lot of people that ended up going to the races that hadn't even planned out that week. They'd see a race car head to the racetrack and they had, man, we're going to go. So, hey, Kelly, uh, do we have time to get up and kind of do a walk around on these cars and see what uh, the Morse has got for this season at the local speedways. Let's uh, jump up out of the seats here, guys. Go take a look. Whoops. Kelly, it sounds gonna be okay with the uh, gimbal and all that. Let's go over here. Uh, first thing I always like asking drivers, we got a couple of things here. This is Jake's car, I mean, what a beautiful car this year. I've always loved, we love big numbers. I've always told everybody that, I've always pounded it in Jake's head, and, and Jeff kind of agrees with me on that, but first you got the number 86 on it, Jake. That's paying homage to your dad. 
Yep, I started out at 07 and then, you know, uh, went, decided to go to 86 just because, you know, there's a lot more meaning to the 86. It's been around, you know, in the family forever and I just felt like I would carry on the tradition of having the number, so I'm excited about that again. All right. Then we got uh, number 27 down below there. You know, our old friend Jim Willard. Man, that guy was battling with your dad, uh, you know, for a lot of years in the 90s up there at uh, East Moline Speedway. And we lost him to cancer, and the good Lord called him home a few years back. But he came around and helped you guys, uh, you know, on the race car there at the end. Yeah, he was like a tremendous help to me. I never won a race. Um, you know, I was young and uh, just trying to figure it out. My maintenance wasn't very good. And he saw me get in a big wreck in uh, 2015. Uh, you know, said he'd help us out, which I would have never thought because my dad and him were such rivals. You know, so I wasn't sure how that would go. And uh, actually, the week he started helping, I got my first win and, you know, won four or five more after that. And uh, he was just like, became like, an, you know, another dad in a way to me just really kind of calmed me down and taught me you know how to actually you know maintenance i think i mean help me you know maintenance the car and stuff and yeah he's a huge help so i always just put his number on my number nielsen morris of course john nielsen your dad yep uh brockman excavating we talked about big john brockman now dirt stars tell me about the products that uh richie's got so he, you know, doesn't really can't help my side of things too much because, you know, his main thing is the pull bar. And we have his plates for the front end, but, you know, the, the pull bars have to be solid in this. You know, he's more of uh, just a good friend and, you know, I want to help him and he tries to help us as much as he can. So, you know, I put that on there. QCJeeps.com, Joe's Rossa. Yeah, Joe and I, you know, he's been a good friend and like a par partner in a way in business as far as like, giving me advice outside. You know, it's hard to listen to your dad all the time, so you gotta have somebody else, so that's more I, of appreciation. I have a hard time listening to your dad. You know, yeah, you and then, know. you know, Spencer Derrickson, Payslip, is uh, Excel, he let me race his car. He's kind of one who kind of made me, you know, get excited about racing again. He was really, really nice to me and treated me really well, so just all put right. on there's appreciation in his shocks and stuff, so, yeah. Uh, JC Bill race cars, Bradley Bill. Yeah, Brad's always been really good to us, you know, support local. He does everything he can. He'll open up the shop to us if we need, uh, if we need it. We're, you know, in a bind and just the, you know, just always been super good to us and everybody around. So, portable mini storage. That's yeah, I have to put that on there for my dad. That's you know, dad. Of course, because yeah. I have it in here. So, yeah, you might need a loan one of these days. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, uh, Kelly, you want to walk around on this thing and then. One of the things that, uh, you know, changed over the years, too, it came in, right, uh, you know, back in the day uh, toward the end of uh, my racing career, but tell us about what we got here. This is your, uh, what you hook up your helmet. You yeah, the, that's uh, my that's my helmet blower. You know, uh, I'm a little claustrophobic. You get that from my old man, and it just gives you some more fresh air, and when you're breathing hard, even though I don't seem too, too bad, but once you have one, it keeps the dust, and I have bad allergies. It keeps helps keep the dust out of there. Man, you know, look. then we got a suppression system in our cars, which I think everybody should do too. That's awesome. What about that number on the roof, Kelly? Is that awesome? Don't mind the wrinkles. I love the big, you know, it looks like, who installed that? Well, yeah, I'll tell you what, I, uh, that's why I'm not a professional with it anymore. Yeah, you're only going <laughs> to put that number on yeah. <laughs> Looking good. Hey, Jake, uh, or uh, Mitchell, come over here. We already know the number seven it came from uh, Big John Brockman. You've got a lot of the same sponsors, but you know I see Jamie Seifer's uh, Concrete Foundations. You've got him on the car again. Yep. And tell me about some of the sponsors you got on your car. Uh, yeah, Jamie Seifer's. He's uh, he's been with us for quite a few years, and uh, uh, J.C. DeBill, Brad DeBill down there. He's uh, he's helped us out a ton over the years since since I started racing. And, uh, BSB, uh, um, they, uh, we got a shock package through them and stuff that we're going to try and they, they've helped out quite a bit, but, Beautiful car. um, yeah, and portable parking lot services, uh, got to take care of Dan. Stars, yeah, so he's always put the pole bars in the car and then he makes a really nice, um, uh, pole bar bracket for on the rear end side that's got tons of adjustment. It's a really... Nice bracket, and then, uh, 
affordable uh, mini storage. Hey, what's the what? Look at that, Kelly. Wopsy Bottom Boys. What is that? SJ. Hey, you don't want to come up with the name, whatever. It's just a group of us buddies that, uh, you know, through the winter time on the weekends, we'll go clown around. We'll actually set up an uh, oval track out on the ice. Yeah. And uh, so mess around through and the woods and. Down in the park, and a bunch of different guys, and yeah. bikes and stuff. Something we only do in Iowa. Yeah. Oh, man. Hey, Kelly, check out uh, the difference between the wing on that thing yep. and the uh, sport mod and the wing you got on this modified. Now, this one's... Jake, how big's this wing what you got you on the um, or, uh, Mitchell? How big's the wing on the modified? It's two inch. Two inch. Two inch. My gosh. That is pretty wild. And look at the size on that one, Kelly. Uh, quite different. Walk over here to the old... Uh, now, this one... This one you run a couple years ago, and it's still turnkey. You'll probably uh, maybe reskin it or put some new lettering on it for up at East Moline. But it's the old S19 car. And what kind of car was this, Mitchell? Uh, this is an old uh, Victory car. Okay. Um, Which were Billy Moyer cars out of Des Moines. Yep. Okay. And uh, this is one you're probably going to run up at the uh, bowl ring. Yep. Probably uh, run this body. Yeah, a little bit, and then try to get fresh it up. Yeah, yeah, you know. Exactly. Why reskin it? Some bumpers and rub rails. <laughs> but that's a blaster. That's why I want to get back over there. Oh, it is a good time. Man, if you can run East Moline, you can run anywhere. So, a real uh, cool car there. Uh, Kelly, would we be able to go in the office, talk to Jeff a little bit about some of the historical picks he's got in there? All right. Jeff? Historical. That really makes us sound good. That means we're old. <laughs> Kelly, I want you to get a shot of this car Jeff started out in 1984, and that's the one that he built in Ronnie Whedon's driveway. And then uh, right next to it would be the 1985 car. And Morris, there was a three-week span, he about one three in a row, but he lifted real early in the turns, <laughs> and somebody drove by him and picked up the win. But I talked him into driving a little, in a little deeper, and finally on uh, week number three, he got his first feature win in that number 80 car. You know who beat him? Tell him who beat you, Jeff. The biggest grubber ever at East Moline. <laughs> 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 ah, Man, boy. That's why he had to quit. <laughs> they, they couldn't get enough security to, to protect uh, me on the way home. Yeah. Everybody. Police escort out to the interstate. <laughs> so that was good old days. Now, come on over here, Kelly. I'm going to show you uh, one of the guys that uh, everybody knows about. He ended up with. I'm going to get the number wrong, about 507 uh, career feature wins, but I was announcing at the race tonight that Ronnie Whedon picked up career win number 500. Jim Willard finished second to him. He had the uh, had his backside, but uh, 500th win, 2003, and he did that. Now, Jeff, that was in one of your old Cobra cars. Yeah, it was. Actually, it was uh, the Cobra car that I raced in 2002. Yeah. Um, Ronnie... Ronnie was kind of stalled. I think he went a couple years. He never won a race. And then he, he bought that car from Jameson's. Yeah. And, uh, uh, man, he took off, and he was fast in that car. Um, and then, uh, in fact, that's the car that, that fell on him when he, when he, uh, when he passed. got killed. Yeah. So, uh, man, old Ronnie Wheaton, he, uh, he just, uh, he was the king for a lot of years. And yeah, that yeah. guy... Finally coming out in that modified, uh, picking up win number 500. It was over there at Davenport Speedway. And I never thought he'd get to it, but, man, he got it and then uh, kept on winning. Pretty cool car. Right above him, that is uh, Jimmy Havlin, that Bardall car, Jeff. And that guy, he's still a friend of mine on Facebook. Uh, man, always clean looking. And now, was that a John Nielsen car? Or, um, or a Nielsen car? Yeah, I think he drove for John's dad, Jr., in the mid-60s, but then in 69, so that, that would be one of uh, Jr.'s cars. And okay. then from 69 to, like, 71, he drove for John Nielsen. In fact, as if you look over to your left, there's a 57 Chevy. That's what Jim Havel drove for John Nielsen. Right there. I think he had a convertible... Uh... Uh, car that you drove for them guys too. Yeah, yeah I, they had a convertible, and then they, I think they had a Chevy too, also. And then they went to the 
Nova body style, you know, after that. Hey, now I want to look at this uh, quad runner over here with all the mud on it. Is that part of the Wapsie deal, or is that just well, the Morris's that, being Morris's? When we we always got something going around here. We we're always running quad runners, or you know, the quad runners, the motorcycles. The, the kids were young there. You know, that was a long oh, time ago. Yeah, yeah, that's over Tow Valley, and uh, but you know, we bought them side by sides. But we always go back to the racing. You know, I bought a side by side a few years ago and thought, wow. I don't, you know, heck with the racing, but we're always back at the racetrack. Over here, Kelly, we got this red number 35 late model. Who did you drive for when you were running that 35 late model? Track? Um, Bill Shores from Clinton, Iowa. That's right. He he owned race cars for a lot of years, and uh, he owned a, a service station in uh, in Clinton called Bluff Services, and he owned race cars for a lot of years. Good guy. Yeah. Over here, now you got a picture of uh, the Quad City Goat, Gary Webb, the number 56. Yeah. Why a picture of Webb in here? Well, you know, if you look around here, there's a lot of different drivers mixed in. And they're, they're all my heroes from when I was growing up, you know. And, uh, and, and before I retired, I'd spent a, my office was actually over in another building, but I spent a lot of time in my office and, you know, you get bored as you're sitting there doing work. It's nice to look up at some of them pictures, and it kind of reminds you of your youth. Yeah. So this uh, helmet over here, Jeff, you got on the shelf. Is this one of Willard's old? Yeah. Ones? This no. What, what that Being is? an open face. I mean, I, I'm just. No. When, when you know Jimmy's dad bumps. Bumps Willard. Ran over in that Joey Chitwood deal, and. Uh, and, diamonds are forever. He drove the stunt car. Yeah. It was an AMC. And he perfected that, what they call the Astro Spiral. Yes. So when he first jumped the ramp and first one to do it, did it in Houston Astrodome. Yeah. But you can see it in the movie, uh, Diamonds Are Forever. Yep. So was this one of Bump's old helmets? No, it was Jimmy's because, you know, his mom and dad were uh, divorced. And then in uh, in the uh, summertime, Jim would actually travel on that Joey Chitwood show with him. Man, And then cool. that was a little helmet he rode, and he'd ride with his dad when he'd run around the track on Jimmy's. Yeah, name, Kelly. That was uh, well, it's named Poss, Possum, they called it. So that was kind of a cool thing to have, uh, you know, over here. And then uh, some of the other pictures you've got over here. Jeff, there was a, uh, a year up at East Moline, and you got a little award for it, and it was, uh, you know, a group of kids with disabilities that uh, came to the track. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I, uh, I won a race, and uh, then a bunch of, so, or, or a couple of kids came down, and they were they were just having fun, and and I knew that, you know, maybe there was something going on there, but then so I just gave them the trophy or whatever, and then afterwards, a whole bunch of you know probably ten or eleven kids came down with their uh, coaches or teachers whatever, and I guess it was for this you know there's you know special kids and special uh, needs yeah yeah and then uh, so they ended up. Area four they special Olympics. They made a big Olympics. deal out of the trophy, and, and um, they had they wanted me to go there to give me an award or something. What well, ended up being a school board meeting, and they awarded that to me, you know, and you know that's pretty cool. What did that mean to you, Jeff? What's that? Pretty important. Oh, for sure. That's probably better than any trophy I ever got. Yeah, you know, for sure. Yeah, you're giving those away. Yeah. Hey, now I see another guy over here too. We want to get a picture of the king of figure eights. <laughs> Right out there, the Jolly Cap was the sponsor of the number one car. Larry Armstrong, he was a man to beat back in the day. Uh, he'd be slugging it out every night with Herschel Roberts up there at East Moline. And uh, he was he was a man to beat up there in figure eights up at he, he the Rockland County Fairgrounds. He was a hero when I was a kid. Yeah, he was. But, but not so much when I was an adult. That all changed, uh, you know, for all of us on the, uh, you know, at the end there. But, uh, you know, over here we got... Pictures of the car, and then what's this over here, Jeff, with uh, Lori? That's um, Bobby Allison. Yeah, that's you know, it's just a, a book signing thing. But that was right after uh, Davey got killed. It was oh, just yeah. a couple months afterwards. So they actually came out and told everybody at the book signing. You know, of course, not to mention his name or anything like that. You know, Davey's name, but and Bobby's really he's a he's a nice guy to talk with. Yeah. This black car that I think you're on right here, that's actually this yellow car out there. And I think the last year that he raced it, that it was ours or whatever, I, 
I don't. Did you win twelve or fourteen races in it? Thirty nine stars. And then it. So then he was like seventh in the nation, was it? Or, yeah. Yep. And man, it was. You know, that was a good year. That's probably. You know, the next year we own our own cars again. Um, um, but they're a different style chassis, and we never did really get them to go too good. And then since then, he's raced for other people every year. So we're. We're glad to just get our own stuff again, and you know our family um, always goes to the races. But there are more of them go, and they're a lot more excited when it's our race car. And you know, good. Um, their their mom goes every week, but she's not always a fan. <laughs> if we're running good, she's the biggest fan we've ever had. Yeah. If we're not running good, it's like a bunch of selling damn race cars. Oh, man. <laughs> well, hey, let's go out and have a seat and wrap this thing up. We're starting to wind down and get to the end of the show. Come out here. Uh, down here. Go back. back. Be back on the mics, Will. All right. So, hey, uh, we're winding this thing down. We've been here about an hour now. Jeff, in closing, uh, what are your thoughts about this racing season? Is there anybody you want to thank or anybody that uh, we may have left out or anything you'd like to talk about? Yeah, not really. You know, I mean, honestly, the people that race with us, uh, we've all been doing it together for years, you know, John Nielsen, John Brockman. Jake's got a couple buddies that helped him from the beginning, you know. Um, so it, it, it's just, um, and then, um, Mitch has, you know, Jamie Stearns helping and Mike, and Mike Wiesenberg and, and, uh, we, we all get along. I'm not going to say we don't ever argue, but it wouldn't be fun if we weren't throwing a hammer in here once in a while or yeah, something, right. you know, and at the end of the day, we're all good and, and, uh, but Jake hasn't raced for a few years, so we'll see how that yeah, goes. We'll see how that one works out. <laughs> uh, Mitchell. What are your thoughts? Now, you're a dad now. Yep. And how many kids do you have now, Mitchell? Two boys. Two boys. Yep. And how old are they? Uh, one's going to be turning four here in the next couple of weeks, and then the other one's six. Okay. So when they get to 16, do you want them to be race car drivers? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll see when we get to that point. My oldest keeps telling me that that's going to be his car. In a oh, few years, hey, you so. never know. It could happen. <laughs> oh, how about you, Jake? Uh, just super grateful to get racing again. You know, there's a lot of people that wish they could do it. I'm just really fortunate, you know, to uh, have a dad and a brother that, and my other brother and my buddies, you know, Joey and Brandon and Spencer and all them just helped me out. And just uh, very fortunate to have a shop to work. And like, you know, people dream of this. And, you know, luckily he's been so into the, you know, racing and just super lucky to just have a place like this. We don't. You know, we can build our own parts a lot of times. Sure. Just super excited, yeah. All right, man. Well, hey, that about wraps it up for this episode number two of the 2022 season of True Grit. We want to thank everybody for tuning in and hope you had a good time. Hope you love racing as much as we do. And we'll have another exciting episode coming up next week. And remember to like and share to all your friends and family. It helps us keep the numbers up and it helps us keep the uh, show going. God bless each and every one of you. We'll see you next week. This is your host Shane Davis saying good night and I'll be seeing you around the track.